Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you all today. It's wonderful to be with the family, always. So today, we want to talk about strength training. And the question is, what does it mean to be strong? And when I say that, you probably think of like somebody like Dwayne The Rock Johnson or someone similar with their physical strength. You know, I think we all kind of understand that strength, right? Workout, eat right, heavyweight, low reps. Those workouts get physically stronger, right? What about strength of character? What makes someone have strength in their spirit? Who comes to your mind with something like that? Probably someone like Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, some of that steely stare that can just pierce right through you. Some tough guy that never smiles, never winces, never shows pain. Hoo-ah! Taking from the squint, tough from the bones, they're squinting their eyes, right? That's who we think about. What if there was somebody, I told you, that makes all these folks look like wet, lightweight wimps? And we'll get to that later on. Let's first talk about how to get strong. What is the workout that makes us a stronger spirit? What is that workout? And we are going to focus on physical strength. We'll, we'll detour it for a moment, but we're talking about stronger spirit. And let's look into our instruction manual. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 22. Well, let's start with David and turn to 2 Samuel 22. This is basically, this is after David regains the kingdom from Absalom. Saul's descendants are hung by the Gibeonites. He and his men have killed giants of the Canaanites who had spears weigh as much as bowling balls that are swinging around all day long. Big, tough dudes. And he knocked them all out. David had been winning left and right, and he wrote the following psalm. And he had every right to be singing. Some lyrics about busting giant heads, taking back his kingdom, rolling in the money. Saving the kingdom. He was the man right now. And David was singing. He was singing loud, clear, and strong. He was singing. And let's, let's read what he's saying. Second Samuel 22, 1 through 18. And this is a long verse, but bear with it. I think it's really good. Second Samuel 22, 1 through 18. The day was spoke to the Lord, these words of his song, on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You saved me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death surround me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol, basically the fancy word for the grave, surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice in his temple and my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, from those that were too strong for me. Now notice that. From those that were too strong for me. David was winning. Left and right he was winning at this point in his life. He was seen as very strong. And he's remembered as a very good king. And David has a secret weapon. It was no trick play, no secret stash of go juice, no shot of funky stuff to get him going. But that's what many people do, right? Chugging down coffee, energy drinks, sometimes some harder stuff, trying to get an edge. Keep going, keep alert, keep ahead. But you know, I've never heard a professional athlete say, hey, let me chug down one more Red Bull for the day. It doesn't work that way, right? Those artificial edges never work out. Sure, they're quick and effective short term, but they never last long haul. Those little shots of five hour energy, End up being about 30 minutes of shaky hands and twitchiness and about four hours of feeling, man, I feel really lousy. <laughs> it doesn't work. 
David knew the real deal. David went straight to God, gave God all the credit, all the glory. God is the one been in the heavens and shaking the earth. David doesn't mention himself once, except to talk about crying out to God. He even states, for they were too strong for me. At the top of his game, David humbled himself before God. And that seems weird, doesn't it? I mean, David should have been cocky. He should have been strutting down the street, chest puffed out, head held high. He was back on top of the world, right? But here he is giving credit to someone else. And many of the things are too much for him. Now, imagine the next Rocky movie. For those of you that can remember Rocky. So imagine if it ended like that. At the last round, the other guy's knocked out. Rocky's hands thrown in the air by the ref. And the crowd's going nuts. And Rocky starts to give someone else credit. Said the other guy was too tough for him. That's a whole other movie, right? But that's what David was doing. Maybe David was an anomaly, though. He was this weirdo that danced and sang in the streets, right? So let's check somewhere else to see what else happens. Let's look at Samson. Now, I said we weren't going to talk about physical strength, but let's detour for a moment and talk about physical strength for just a moment. Let's look at Samson. Now, there was a physically strong guy. This was a guy that took a jawbone of a donkey and wiped out a thousand Philistines. He must have been pumping iron constantly to build that strength, right? Well, let's read and see what he was, his workout was. Judges 16, 27 through 30. Judges 16, 27 through 30. And it reads, Now the temple was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistine were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. He braced himself against him, one on his right hand, one on the left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's, and all the people were in it. So the dead that he killed in his death more than he killed in his life. Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Even this super strong guy was calling up the Lord in prayer for his physical strength. No shot of steroids, no adrenaline boost, no special outfit, no Air Jordans, no physical aid or performance enhancers of being asked for to boost his physical performance. But something's calling on God. And that's really weird too, right? You think he'd be calling for his gold gyms membership or the, you know, those new fancy Peloton bikes or the CrossFit bro trainer that's going to get out there and pump him up and get him going. But he didn't call on any of that. Samson was one odd dude, right? He was super strong, but he was really odd. So that, that's, that's a detour for physical strength. What about more folks who think about as having real strong character? What about Job? Let's look at him. He had a really strong spirit, right? Now, Job had it really bad. He lost his wealth, his health, his children in a very short time span. He was left with nothing but his life, his wife, and his friends. And of those, his wife told him to curse God and die, and his friends told him something must be wrong with him for all this to happen to him. But still, Job did not give up. Sure, he wished he was dead, and that he was never born, actually quite a lot. But he never jumped off the cliff. He never gave up. He had a pretty good reason to moan and complain, but he never gave up. He kept going. He never lost his faith in God. And Job was about at the low point in his life as a person can get right now. But he kept going. And this is what he says. This is Job 12, 7 through 16. Job 12, 7 through 16. Begins verse 7. But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds are there. And they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And whose hand is the life of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words, and the mouth taste its food? Wisdom is with aged men, and with length of days understanding. And right here in verse 13, he switches gears and he starts describing God. And as he describes God, he continues in verse 13. With him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. If he breaks a thing down, 
it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. If he withholds the water, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. With him are strength and prudence. Now notice in verse 10, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. And 13, with him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. Here is Job at the lowest point in his life. And yet he's talking about someone else. He's not staring into his navel here. He's looking out and up. Now think about this as a non-Christian. That's some pretty weird stuff, right? This guy's whole world fell apart, and yet he isn't caving in on himself. He obviously had some fortitude to be able to keep going, but he isn't looking inward. But what do we hear? What about all that power within and unleashing it? It's all within you. Remember the Kung Fu Panda, the Dragon Scroll? Take of the Dragon Scroll is, it's all within you, Poe. You already had the special. But where's Job's Dragon Scroll? Where's his motivational speaker? Right now telling that he's the one to pick up the pieces and pull it back together. Job wasn't looking within. He was looking up. Now, let's look at someone else. Another example, Joshua. Joshua had to wait over 40 years to get into the promised land. And then, as one of the two oldest living Israelites, led the battle to conquer Canaan. And here he is at the age of 110, rallying the people of Israel with a famous and stirring speech. And from an outside perspective of the world today, you'd think at this point in his life, we expect him to talk about a good diet, mental fortitude, some fish oil maybe, good climate, something like that. That's how you know most people that you know that live life's long age and be successful talk about. You expect Josh to say something like, "At the age of one ten, I accomplished this all by this little magic pill." That's what we'd expect if he was on TV today, right? But he doesn't say that. Let's look in Joshua 24, 14 and 15. This is what Joshua says. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods of which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Now, mind you, both of those have been thoroughly defeated right now. So this is basically saying, choose God or choose the losers. <laughs> but this is, in the next part, he delivers this famous line. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was one of the greatest leaders in the Bible forcefully declares that the secret is service to God. Joshua's strength came from serving God. And that gets us to a workout. Humility, praying, serving. This is what these incredibly strong men gave the credit to. And there's all one common thread, and that's God. That's the workout that time and again is how these examples gained their strength. They were humbled and looked to God and said themselves like the example from David and Job. They prayed to God, like the example from Samson. They served God, like the example of Joshua. Now, that workout seems backwards, right? So backwards, so wrong, based on what we're taught by the world. I mean, compare this. Strength comes from within. You don't need anyone else. You have it within yourself. Versus strength comes from God, from humility and service to God. Now, let's see how that works in the golden example, Jesus. How does God incarnate show us how this works? Let's talk about a guy. Remember we said we talked about a guy who put everybody else to shame? This is the dude. This is the one. Now, when we think about him coming to earth, many people think about his birth like that famous nativity scene, right? It's peaceful. It's quiet. Star in the sky. Angels singing. And that's what probably a lot of people think. But if you really think about it, it probably should have been more like this. Little baby with my chest and about three or four hundred pounds. Because think about this. Think about when you're in, you got your comfy bed in the morning and you're sitting there and it's so hard to get out of. And you think of, kind of like this little guy is thinking, I just got comfy. You want me to get out? 
Now, think about leaving that comfy bed and you've got something you dread to do that day. Maybe some appointment you'd rather not keep. Now compare that to God. Choose and leave paradise. Come down to this nut house called earth in the form of Jesus and starting out as a baby. Not simply starting in the middle of the action as an adult, but going through all the embarrassments and issues that come from starting out as a baby. It's hard to imagine being humble enough to go from being with God as God and taking part in the creation of the universe to being a helpless little human baby and having to have your booty whacked. That's a big contrast there. And Jesus, his appointment that he didn't want to keep, he knew what was coming for him. He knew what happened when he got out of that comfy place. His eventual appointment that he didn't want to keep was death on the cross. He had to go through everything for us. Jesus showed incredible strength, volunteering to go through all that he did. Clint Eastwood's cowboy character and not, had to get out of some tough situations in the movies. And John Wayne didn't have a movie called True Grit. Honestly, Jesus puts them all to shame. He gave up everything in paradise to come to this crazy place, tortured, mocked, humiliated, killed like a criminal, all to save our sorry hides. But he did it. And think about this. It wasn't like in the movies. In the movies, you've got Superman. He gets kryptonite around his neck. He's weakened. That wasn't what happened with Jesus. Turn to John 13, 3-5. John 13, 3-5. Beginning in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he kept, which he was girdled. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. He's like Superman at full peak power, right? Restraining himself and going through all of that willingly, calmly. Now, Jesus could, could crush the whole earth at this moment. God the Father had handed him over the keys to the nuclear arsenal. Jesus was resolved to serve God, our, the Father. Through all the trials, the torture, the taunting, the exhaustion, the pain, Jesus never wavered. He never flinched. He never backed down. And he never lost his cool. He never lost his temper and all the chances he had, and rightfully so that he should have. But he didn't. He was that strong. Jesus was strong, amazingly, absolutely, incredibly strong. And honestly, this picture of Superman is actually almost an insult compared to how powerful and strong-willed Jesus was. Even Superman's weak in comparison. Now, how did Jesus get this strong? What was his workout like? What did he do? He's our golden example. An example that we're, based our, we're supposed to base ourselves on. Did Jesus follow the same workout as others to get his strength? Did he humble himself? Did he pray? Did he serve? Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much his whole life. And let's look at that. His coming to earth and humbling himself to take on human form. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Get into verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, both those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself incredibly just to do what he did, just coming to this earth, let alone all the things he did here. He prayed incredibly hard. And thank you, Brother VR, for reading this during the communion, because this is exactly it. He, he prayed, it was like sweats of drops of blood. It's reading Luke 22, 41 through 44. Luke 22, 41 through 44. Again, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, 
take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him. And in being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He prayed harder than we can ever imagine. And he came here to serve. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rules of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them? Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus humbled himself. <clears throat> he prayed, and he served more than anyone. He is a great example for this type of workout to get stronger spiritually. Now, we know this workout was used. The results are clear that it worked. But how? How did it work? Like with the examples from earlier, it's what Jesus did. But why? Why did he do that? It seems so backwards from what we would normally think about things, right? So let's look at what is said for, for this type of workout. Let's start with humility. Now, for humility, let's turn to James 4.10. Real short verse, James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God lifts us. He's the one doing the lifting. Let's look at praying. Romans 8, 26 through 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. God helps us. God is the one who helps us and even helps our prayers when we don't know how to express ourselves. What about serving? Let's turn to John 12, 26. In John 12, 26, it reads, If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. God is the source of glory. God is the one who, who starts all this. He lifts us. He helps us. He is the source of all true glory. It's not us that's getting stronger, but our bond to God that is growing stronger. Now, let's put that in contrast with this. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Foolishness compared to the power of God. If you look at this from the outside, it seems wrong. It seems crazy, even kind of ridiculous to humble yourself, give credit to someone else, call on someone else, serve someone else to be strong. When we don't see who God is and what the real deal is, it's crazy talk. However, when we see God for who he really is, the true king, the all-powerful, the eternal Lord of the universe, it makes sense. And given that, we choose sides. We are not our own creator. We are not our own savior. We are not our own power. And given that undeniable truth, we have to make a decision. Matthew six twenty four. No one can serve two masters, for either I hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God money. Everyone serves someone, whether they delude themselves in thinking that is themselves, their possessions, the crazy in this world. They've chosen not God. There is nothing true that can come from serving lies. 
there is no true strength, no true glory that comes from lies. Like those artificial performance enhancers. It may last for a short time, but in the end, it falls apart. Always. No lie lasts forever. However, in contrast, we recognize God for who he is. We choose truth. We enlist in the true king's army. We now have God's arsenal backing us up. We now have God's wisdom, his strength and power watching over us. And the paradoxical part is, it seems like a paradox, but you have to realize the way to train true power is to realize that we have none. But that is the truth. The way to true power is to give ourselves up, empty ourselves out, give up trying to save ourselves, and go to work for God instead of lies. The right choice is God. And let's look at example, Jesus' example and what he did. We know that he humbled himself simply by coming to this earth and through all that he went through. We know all the power that he exhibited here on earth, the incredible self-control, the patience, the mercy, that, the love that he showed. Jesus possessed great strength and power in this earthly form. But let's compare that to afterwards. Let's read a little bit from Revelation and get a sense of the power of Jesus after his time here on earth. Now, that's figurative language, as we can't truly comprehend the power. But if you listen to the language, you can sort of get a sense of it. Revelations 19, 11 to 16. Revelations 19, 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven open. Called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with an iron rod. He himself treads the winepress, the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now my name is Rex, and that's Latin for King. And I kind of enjoy that name. I think it's a pretty good name. But imagine me called, in all caps, mind you, King of King and Lord of Lords. It's a really nice name to have, right? And if we skip down a few verses, we get to the big battle at the end of time. Revelations 19. 19 through 20. And this is the big, big battle to end it all. It's two verses. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and within him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive at the lake of burning fire with brimstone. The big battle it all leads up to two verses. They gather, it's over. It's not even a fight. It's simply done as, as soon as it starts. Now that is very real true power. The boxing match doesn't even last before the, the sound of the opening bell clears the air. God is a source of strength and power. If you think about it though, God is the creator of all strength and power. So that makes sense. If we know the truth, if we see things for what they are, all this is simple, straightforward. However, if we don't know the truth or yet see things for what they are, this is where it takes some of our own strength to change things. And if it is our own, it isn't much, but it's enough. God gave us free will. We do get to choose. It should be a really cho easy choice, but until we see it, it's not. From the outside, the choice is one of trust. Do I trust God enough to give myself to him and see what plans he has for me? And that's the decision we all have to make. It's scary from the outside. Giving up all that we know, getting ourselves to someone, something greater than I am, knowing that there's something else out there greater than me. And listen to God's army blindly is about as crazy and listen to the U.S. army blindly. We need to search. We need to learn. Get to know God. Get to know what true love is and true strength are. And once we do that, the choice becomes easy. This New Year's, 
Everybody makes resolutions usually around New Year's. All the gyms are closed, though, so we may not be hitting the gym. But a good resolution is get stronger spiritually. Humility, praying, serving, no matter who you are, it's a workout we all can do. And as you do that workout and you live your life, you find that it, it yields results. You'll be better, stronger than you could ever imagine. Our God is a great God, and he does not disappoint. If you want to make the choice to recognize God for who he is, join his family. If you have any prayer requests, please let us know as you sing the invitation song. <laughs>